guys have asked us for years, why don't you do a CP3 pump conversion on these Ford trucks like this? The short answer is it won't fit, but the real answer is it technically can, but there's a lot of drawbacks and compromises you have to make to do it. We worked on it several years ago and actually abandoned it, but we'll go inside and I'll show you why. So there's no doubt here at SNS Diesel Motorsport, we love CP3 high pressure pumps. This is a Bosch pump. We've used it thousands and thousands of them for years. It's a great architecture. Um, this is our, has been our preferred pump for years when we're doing either high output uh, race pumps or we're doing CP4 to CP3 conversions, which we've sold a lot of those. We developed those and, and made CP3 conversions really a, a kind of a household name and very popular for the LML Duramax platform that had a CP4 pump originally and 2019 to 2020 Cummins, which had a CP4 originally. Um, the CP3s are great. We have been asked for years, how's come, why don't you guys do a CP3 conversion for the Ford? Well, like I mentioned, the short answer is it, it won't fit. Uh, the optimal place, obviously, to put a high pressure pump conversion is in the original location where it was. But several years ago, we're working on all kinds of different options. We're looking at fitting Denso pumps into this thing, highly modified versions of that. That wasn't a great idea. We were doing highly modified CP4s with a lot of reliability improvements in them. A lot of drawbacks to that too, not real comfortable with it. And we're looking at what do we do with a CP3? So you can't fit a CP3 here in the valley. There are and have been for years, dual fueler kits, dual pump kits, where they drive a belt driven CP3 on these. So we evaluated that several years ago. We were working on uh, you know, that as a potential solution. This was before the DCR was a thing. Um, there's a major drawback, obviously. The first thing you gotta get past is it's a belt driven primary pump. You usually want all your critical components to be gear driven, but this is the only option is a belt driven pump. So if you can get past that, that's, that's a major hurdle. Uh, if you have a belt failure, obviously the engine's off, not running. Um, a couple of the other issues, the even more so honestly, is it eliminates the dual alternator option here. I didn't really want to tell a customer, hey, I know you paid extra for that dual alternator option, but now you have to get rid of it or you eliminate a certain population of the market anyways that need to maintain their dual alternator. Another issue that we see here, we test lots of pumps all the time. Customers send us pumps, they're troubleshooting issues. Hey, I got a stock pump with a bunch of miles on it. Uh, I just wanna make sure it's healthy. We can almost always tell if that pump happened to be a dual pump truck with a belt drive. The reason we can tell that is because when you have a pump, <clears throat> CB3, wherever it's at, doesn't matter what the engine is, when you're belt driving it, you have the pulley sitting here and you got a lot of belt tension because you need a lot of belt tension to try to keep that thing from slipping. You have a lot of belt tension pulling down on that cam nose. That's not normal for how these things were designed originally. So the problem is what we usually see is quite a bit of bushing wear where that cam is pulling down like that. So you can almost always tell the orientation it's in because there's wear on one side in particular and that cam can kind of get sloppy in there because of bushing wear that's gonna cause issues longer term. So if you're talking about a truck that you're just souping up and it doesn't get a lot of miles it's kind of a play truck you got a dual fueler on it not that big a deal if you're talking about this is the primary pump for lots lots of hours lots of years we weren't real comfortable with what might happen down the road when you're talking about bushing wear because of all that belt tension pulling down this particular pump was a secondary belt driven pump on a 6.7 forward that came in with an external fuel leak the bushings in this particular case had worn so much that it allowed extra cam movement and lip seal leakage. This is fairly extreme, but this is what can happen in these cases. So another issue that we had to evaluate was on the Fords, obviously there's electric supply pump. The pressure regulation happens in the CP4 or in the DCR. Um, the CP3 is plumbed differently and has a gear pump on the back as well. So if you try to stick a CP3 in there with a gear pump, you have functionally a supply pump to a supply pump to a high pressure pump. Normally Cummins ones run at, you know, 5, 10, 15 PSI, something like that. The Ford pump's gonna try to run at, it'll deadhead basically like 110 PSI if there's not a pressure regulator in the system. So um, you also have to try to get across that hurdle. Do you wanna work the supply pump at max deadhead pressure all the time and work this gear pump hard by cramming pressure into it? Or do you have another additional pressure regulator somewhere? I've seen gear pumps actually drive tangs and gear pumps fail on the CP3s if they have too much supply pressure. So that was another thing that we were evaluating. Hey, do we come up with another solution for this? Are we okay with it or not? Um, 
Also, where you have to do that uh, to mount it, you're gonna have to come up with some different versions of high pressure lines, low pressure lines. Every additional line you add is additional cost for one, but even worse is potential for reliability issues. So we try to reduce the number of lines as possible. Every line you add, especially high pressure lines, that's two more high pressure joints that can leak. Um, and uh, on the low pressure side as well, it's just obviously not gonna be at 30 some thousand PSI, uh, but leaks in the valley are always bad or leaks anywhere. Other major challenge that you have to get over is the vacuum pump drives off the front of the high pressure pump gear. So there's um, basically a slot there that drives a paddle inside of the vacuum pump. You need to be able to maintain your vacuum pump for a lot of the factory um, you know, options in the truck. Well, if you get the CP4 out of here and you drive a CP3 somewhere else, you can't just do a block off plate or something like that. You have to either do some sort of gutted CP4 that we were playing around with, or you got to do a bearing carrier system uh, that will hold us. You have to make a stub shaft of a CP4 basically in a gear carrier to then hold this gear purely just to drive the vacuum pump. That seemed like a lot of complexity, extra cost, and you gotta think, okay, well, am I gonna feed it with pressurized oil to lubricate it? Am I gonna run sealed bearings? How long are these bearings gonna last? Is this an additional maintenance item that I'm gonna add that can potentially fail? And if it does fail, it's probably gonna seize up the gear train and potentially slip your crank gear. We didn't feel real comfortable with that either. Not that that couldn't be you know, dealt with or achieved. It just was another major hurdle of what you have to do just to carry this gear um, without creating basically additional failure points. We're trying to simplify systems, not add complexity. So that was another thing that we were like, okay, between all these number of additional challenges, compromises we had to deal with, we weren't super happy with it. Another thing that's a reality on CP3s too, these were validated to 1800 bar originally for Bosch. So all the systems were 1800 bar cap. We obviously use CP4s like crazy in a lot of different applications and we'll abuse them at much, much higher than that. But usually those are competition race car applications that are uh, limited use. So you're talking seconds, maybe minutes at a time at high pressures, not hours, days at a time at high pressure. So that's another thing you have to get over is, okay, well, what's this thing? Newer Fords can run at 2,500 bar, um, 36,000 PSI. So is this thing gonna like that or not for long use. Another topic when you're trying to do a conversion with a high pressure pump in general is the pressure pulsations in the rail. So CP4 is a two piston pump, but a two lobe cam. So that actually makes four pressure pulsations every revolution that are feeding into the rail. The DCR is a two cylinder pump also, but because the bottom end design, it's actually just a two pulse per revolution pump. A CP3 is a three cylinder pump. So you get three pulses per, per revolution. So there's no way that you're gonna match the CP4's actual pressure waves and, pri and timing and everything like that. It doesn't matter what you use, it's gonna be different. Usually that's fine, um, but that's another consideration that usually you don't know until you get them on the trucks and you get quite a few of them on the trucks as to whether you're gonna run into um, subtle issues with pressure control um, that's gonna cause problems. One example, honestly, when we launched the DCR, we had a single line coming out of it. For the reasons I mentioned, we wanna to try to reduce the amount of leak joints as possible. The DCR can run with a single line instead of two. So we had one capped off and we had one single line. For odd reasons due to pressure waves in the system that should be the same, we would end up with some odd rail pressure behavior on some of our field test trucks. We went to a two line setup and it was fine. So things like that are a little hard to validate sometimes until you just get a bunch of them in the field and kind of test it out. Either way, we evaluated, like I said, we evaluated heavily modified CP4s. We weren't comfortable with that. We evaluated uh, HP4 Denso pumps, uh, which are like in the L5P Duramax trucks. You'd have to also heavily modify those. That wasn't a good idea. We wanted to try the CP3, uh, but because of all those challenges and concerns that I mentioned, we weren't comfortable with launching that product and putting our name on it and it being a good option for customers. Around that time is when the partnership with Stanadyne started and we um, started working on the DCR conversion. And this was the thing we've been waiting on all that time. Basically a proper pump that fit where it was supposed to go and didn't have a lot of those extra parts, extra pieces and extra challenges. So 
we're happy that this uh, came to fruition so we didn't have to continue to pursue some of these other options. And uh, we think it's the best solution for the Fords. But, you know, competition's always good and uh, companies need to keep developing. So thanks for listening.